probably the greatest sense of elation right up there in my top five is when I broke the speaking world record. My voice has never recovered six years on. That was the hardest thing I've ever done. I had out of body experiences. Even David Goggins looked at me and went, man, how did you speak for 40 hours out of straight? And he is like the most hardcore person on the yeah. planet. Basically, been a year almost since my launch of my podcast, The Steepest Honey Study. So I felt it was only right to uh, get the man who influenced me to start my own podcast onto the podcast, which is Rob Moore. And funny enough, on the way there, I'm going to be finishing off my episode of the Disruptive Entrepreneur. Uh, his uh, interview with Katie Hopkins, pretty good one. So I'm looking forward to it. Hi, it's Rob Moore here, and I'm with Steve Sully. Hiya. Uh, so, Steve and I have become good friends. Uh, I think we met when you did my podcast course, is that right? Yeah, I was on, uh, I think it was the launch of Money. Okay, the book. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my, so, basically, just taking the clock back, I was um, a mentor E on progressive property. Yeah. Been mentored by a few of, a few of your, uh, your staff members. Okay. And I had been involved with the community for about six months, and then my missus bought me a book which gave me a free three day course, I think it was, to yep. money. Yep. And the back end of it was all about podcasts. And me and you got talking on the yep. stairs, I remember, after yep. talking about watches for some yeah, time. That's how I noticed you. You had a Patek Philippe on That's it. You? Yeah. I picked that straight out. I still got that buried yeah. away somewhere. Yeah. And um, yeah, it just, it just took off from there. So yeah, um, yeah I just, I, I'm loving the journey so far. And uh, I'm a year into it. And this is the whole point of um, me getting you onto the podcast is because I wanted to pay respect to you. Um, I'm not dead yet, mate. Well, <laughs> come and pay my respect. Yeah. But, but you're the one who gave me the inspiration and a bit of a push to say, you know, I think you even said to me when I, when I met you that you felt like I had the personality for it. And yeah. I not, don't know whether that was, I, I did or, or you just saw something that I didn't see and I just ran with it. And I've got about 55, 54 episodes now, I think. Great. So, um, yeah, it's been a great journey so yeah. far. So the purpose of this live and the interview, we've got two cameras, three cameras here, five cameras here, is uh, for you to interview me on your show. Yeah. So do you want to tell everyone what your show is called and then I'm all yours? So the Stephen Sully study is my ongoing study, my ongoing research into successful people. Success is not just about one thing such as money, for example, even though that is part of it. It could be anyone driven, anyone focused, anyone who's got a real purpose in life. So I've interviewed entrepreneurs, I've interviewed uh, sports people from boxers, uh, rugby um, professionals, footballers. I've interviewed artists. Um, I have a brand called Wood uh, Woodbury House, which is an art agency in the heart of Soho, and we represent a few different artists. So through my network, I've got a range of different people that I consider quite successful, and without a doubt, you're successful not just in one area, but many areas. So Thank you. I believe that people can get inspiration, motivation, and more importantly, an education from you. Mm. So podcasting, let's talk about that. Yeah. How important do you think the modern day business, the modern day person, how important do you think it is for them to have something like a podcast attached to their business? Um, I think if you want to be an influencer, I think if you want to create leads for your business, I think if you want to have... Um, leverage of your time, i.e. you create a piece of content once and then for many years you get benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Podcast's got to be right up there. It's got to be right up there with having a good YouTube channel. I think the really big benefit of a podcast over a YouTube channel is you have to be at home or in the office or in front of a laptop sat down to watch a YouTube video. But you and I are both pretty into um, you know, fitness and exercise and you can list a podcast when you're running, when you're training when you're in the car, when you're on the plane, the train, the boat, when you're doing your walks. I do walking meditations at the moment and I um, sometimes um, interrupt that to, to listen to a podcast. I listen to podcasts every morning when I go and get my 5.30 a.m. coffee at the Costa drive through mm -hmm. So podcasts are so good because you can connect with people globally. Now you can connect with people globally on YouTube, on Facebook, etc. But YouTube, YouTube and Facebook to a certain degree interrupt you. So you're scrolling the Facebook feed, you might see your video and my video and it stops you doing what you're doing and, and you've been interrupted. 
And sometimes that interruption is accepted, but sometimes that's really annoying. Mm -hmm. Like you should see Facebook ads and people's complaints on that because really that ad is interrupting them. Whereas a podcast never interrupts. Not, you never interrupt your life to listen to a podcast. You listen to it when you choose. Mm -hmm. You think, oh, I haven't listened to a podcast for a week or two. I'm ready to listen to a podcast. A new episode, I'm ready, I'm there, I'm keen. And that's powerful because people are choosing to listen to you when they want on their terms. Therefore, the connection, the rapport is much better. I mean, I do a lot of marketing uh, and I use Facebook ads and I use uh, YouTube uh, and I run lots of campaigns on Facebook. Um, and sometimes you do have to interrupt people and sometimes they kind of don't like that. Mm. Or it's not as warm a connection. Um, I think the next thing about podcasting is... Um, you, you, you've got flexibility in form. So with Twitter, you've got a small amount of characters. With LinkedIn, you've got a 10 minute video maximum and I think 256 or whatever text characters. But with the podcast, it could be a five minute caffeine cast or it could be a three hour Joe Rogan, full on mad, you know, random deep dive, controversial. Talk about DMT and yeah, acid and with anything. Mike Tyson. Yeah, yeah. exactly, anything. And so you've got that flexibility of the media. And that's one of the reasons I like it. You're into art. You're an art dealer. I'm, I like art and I'm a, quite an arty person. And I like the creativity and flexibility where I, my podcast can be whatever it wants. Yeah. Um, so though, look, there's loads of benefits. Obviously, I'm going through those. I think that um, in the world at the moment, a per, being a personal brand, having a personal brand, being known as an individual and not just a company, that has massive equity because one you have another asset there. You know, so you have your art business, mm -hmm. but let's say um, there was a fire and you, and, you know, you lost loads of your stock. Well, if you've got a million podcast listeners, uh, you've still got an asset over there. Mm -hmm. um, let's say you know, there's a massive crash in the property market and my property company or my property portfolio got disrupted. I've still got my big podcast following, which is also linked intrinsically to my YouTube channel, because I guess you'll probably put this on YouTube as yeah. well. So, so podcasts are linked to other media. Um, it's very intimate. Like, and that sounds kind of strange, but people put things in their ears to listen to you. That's very intimate. Mm -hmm. They're you are literally that close to them. And when you listen to something <clears> on <throat> headphones, you know, they can hear you breathe in. It's really intimate. Um, I'm not standing like a weirdo <laughs> here, but, but it is, it's the most intimate media that's not one-to-one. -one. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's the closest to one-to-one. -to -one. And we know that one-to-one -one creates the best rapport. Yeah. Um, cause I run physical events and we do you know, in person and they are the best. They are the most rapport. They make you the most sales, the most, um, you know, per head revenues or lifetime client values or whatever. Um, and of course it's good timing. Yeah. It, it would, it was terrible timing 10 years to do, ago to do a podcast. We're in the moment where podcasts are growing. Everyone's talking about it. You know, you know, because people say everyone's got a podcast. Yeah. Well, no, everyone hasn't got a podcast. Walk down Peterborough High Street and go, you got a podcast, mate, got a podcast, mate. Go down KFC, got a podcast, mate, got a podcast, mate. No, most people haven't got a podcast, but a lot of people are getting them. Um, Out of my circle of friends, I don't know anyone, bar the people I've met via business, and there's only a few still there, I don't really know anyone's got their own podcast mm -hmm. um, channel. I know people have got Facebook pages and Instagram pages, yeah. but not podcasts. No, because it's not caught up yet. Mm. Uh, and I think it will. Um, it's disrupted radio because with radio, you have to sit through all the ads and you have to sit through for ages and you have to listen to it when it's there. Whereas let's say your, this episode with me pops up. You can go, oh, I'll listen to that tomorrow when I'm going on the train at three o'clock. You mm -hmm. can't do that with a radio station. All right, there's a bit of in, on, on demand now or a bit of like iPlayer type stuff. But it's so much, it's such a convenient medium as well as an intimate medium. And, you know, there, there's loads of other reasons. Obviously, you can make loads of money out if you want. I chose not to revenue, create the revenue from ads. I was going to come on to that, yeah, actually. Well, uh, <laughs> because you just mentioned about uh, you, you run marketing strategies and stuff, but yet you don't monetize it. So mm. what, what I know you kind of don't need to. Yeah. But surely if there's an opportunity where you could probably make another, I don't know, 500 grand, a million pound a year, wouldn't that make sense? Yeah, I think in some ways it... It would. Um, I guess I see it that it's like a golden goose and I just want to keep feeding it and letting it lay eggs. Okay. Maybe one day I'll get the, you know, the knife out and go Psh! and have a, a great big dinner on it. But for now, I, I, I feel good that I didn't need to monetize it from day one. I mean, I've done 400 and odd episodes. 
So the ad revenue on that would be significant. And I will be honest with you, um, because people would think I'm lying if not. There's going to come a day where I look at how much money I'm leaving on the table and I'm like, whoa, I'm, 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 not, I'm just going to get rid of all those principles and I might start running it. But also, if I've got, you know, three, four million listeners or whatever, mm -hmm. then I don't want to upset half of them. Now, in America, no one really cares about ads as much. In England, they're a bit more sensitive to it. Um, but the way I see monetization of, of a model, um, you, you just sort in the mic out. Yeah. yeah. All right. No worries. We'll just um, take a little break while Steve's getting his mic sorted out. Harry's under the desk. Boys, hey boys yeah. Not the first time. <laughs> <laughs> it's lonely this job sometimes, Harry, isn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's all right. No problem. Um, the way I see it with monetization of your podcast or any media. Um, it's just about where you monetize it. So I don't run ads uh, and I'm definitely leaving hundreds of thousands of pounds. It might even get, up, get into the millions at one point on the table there. But because I don't run ads, I get more goodwill. I ha get less bounce of people listening. Um, and therefore, I probably get more trickle down revenue because, you know, some people who run podcasts, it's their only um, revenue generating source. Mm -hmm. And if that was me, I would monetize it and I'd run ads. I'm not like, scared of running ads. I don't think that, I think only a very small percentage of my um, listeners would be really like pissed off with that. But keep it pure. Have people not feel like I've got an ulterior motive for um, running the podcast. Because if you get a sense really all this podcast is, is you're doing the content as a throwaway so that you can use the ad revenue. For me, that's not what it's about. Um, it, it's about the form. But um, I'm fortunate enough, I have written 15 books. I've got most of them on audio. I've got loads of different courses and masterminds, etc. that people can just easily find all my other work through the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I like that they find their own way. I'm not forcing them to go anywhere. They find their way onto like you did the money event, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I would align myself on, on ads if a brand came along that I love. Like if McQueen wanted to run ads on my podcast or if Odomar's PK wanted to run ads on my podcast or Richard Meal did or... Um, Patek Philippe. Uh, yeah, or, or Patek Philippe um, or Yves Saint Laurent. I, I probably would because if I can align with a brand that I love, I love the values of the brand and... So I've always said I don't run ads, but I don't think I've ever said I will never. Because yeah. I don't think you should ever say, you should never say never or always. So just if you think I've said <sighs> I'm never running ads, no, I never had have run ads. But um, if the right brands come along, maybe I will. Well, do you know like the people that don't really know what a podcast is or even heard about it? Let's, let's look at some of the elite, you know, Tim Ferriss, maybe even... Um, Tony Robbins, but of course I'm like Joe Rogan, who's a juggernaut in the podcast yeah, industry. Is. Yeah. What, what kind of revenue do these guys make? Oh, millions. Um, now, I, it, it depends on your source. People think Joe Rogan makes anywhere from the high hundreds of thousands up to like 10 million. Um, millions on his podcast. I mean, about a year ago, I heard a figure that he's had 3 billion downloads. And now, obviously, he's done quite a few hundred episodes, but even divide that by quite a few hundred, that's still masses, masses. Um, I think what's pretty smart about the revenue model behind Joe Rogan's is, yes, he runs ads, mm -hmm. but he also runs ads for companies that he has a share in and an interest. So in a way, he's double dipping there. Uh, I'm, I'm, that is smart. Yeah. It is smart. He also promotes a lot of UFC, and that'll be in his contract with the UFC, I'm sure. I don't know, I've not seen his contract, but you know, why else would he push it so much? I know he likes martial arts, but I bet you he's getting a good uplift in his contract with the UFC for doing that. Because he's a pundit for them yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly, so that's gonna be in there. Um, and then the fourth way he does it is if, he, if Joe Rogan just says, hey, I'm gonna be in Seattle doing a comedy show in two weeks time, you just know you've got 10,000 people in the audience. So it also helps fill his comedy shows. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's really clever. I think last time I heard Tim Ferriss talk about his downloads, and again, this would have been about a year ago, it was 300 million. And, you know, look, just 1% of that, they're just, they're mind-boggling numbers. My numbers are nowhere near that. But then that also excites me, because I've been doing podcasts as long as them, mm. and I just think that's, that's where we're going. Um, 
the thing about a podcast that's so great as well is um, if you think about it, normally the older something becomes, the more it decays. Okay, mm -hmm. watches, houses, some art can sometimes go up in value the older it gets. But, Cars. Yeah, yep. yeah, some. <laughs> yeah, a few. Um, but 99% of things that you would buy, these cameras, this phone, you know, this microphone pack, it goes down in value, it decays, it reduces its value. But with a podcast, it's the opposite because my highest downloaded podcast is my oldest one, episode one. Really? Yeah, because it's episode one. Hmm. And um, some podcasts just keep growing um, the longer they're there. So it's kind of the opposite in terms of its value. It, it's like having a vintage watch or a vintage car or a house, you know, an investment property. The value of them goes up over time. Hmm. Um, not always, but <clears throat> I mean, if you think about it, the, the, the episode that's probably most likely to be downloaded when someone new comes to your podcast is the latest one or the first one. So they're, in that moment in time, your two biggest assets. But normally something that's four years old is worthless. Yeah. But my highest worth podcast is the oldest. Um, I interviewed a guy called Tim Lovejoy mm. on Sunday yeah, Brunch, yeah. Yeah. and he's got his own podcast as well. Yeah. I actually met him through um, a, uh, an artist who we represent, a guy called Scooney. Really mm -hmm. cool guy. He collected his work. And anyway... Come on my podcast, and he said, "In life, you should do three things. Number one, that something that makes you money. Number two, something that gets you fit and healthy. And number three, something that makes you cr creative." Yeah. And he said, "The reason why he does his podcast is not for the money. Yeah. It's not to get himself rich or, or fit. It's just to become cr creative." Yeah. Would you support that? Yeah, I mean, I'd add something in terms of happiness and fulfillment. Yeah. If we're talking about rules, um, but yeah, I've never really thought about it like that. But I, I don't think a lot of my listeners necessarily understand this, so this will be nice for them to hear this. I've always said that me doing a podcast, there's an amount of catharsis or therapy involved, i.e. The, the emotions I bottle, you know, I spend a lot of my day and my week biting my lip and keeping my gob shut. And that's something that I'm not very good at. It's something that I've learned over time. Because if I just blurted about how I feel every day, we were talking before, weren't we, about business, no matter mm. how good it's going, it's going good for you, it's going good for me, but there are still challenges. Mm. And sometimes you want to go, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. You know, or why'd you fucking say that? Or, you know, whatever. Um, and I go around biting my lip because it's a learned skill in business because yeah. I realise sometimes, yes, my mouth makes me a lot of money because it can lose me a lot of money. So my podcast is a way for me to release the tension, the emotion, the daily challenge and, and, and the cathar so it's my catharsis, but it's also the more of that I bring to my podcast, the better it is I find for my listeners. If I just went, the seven ways to be successful in business, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's informative, but it's not inspiring, educating, motivating, real, etc. Um, so, yeah, it's a very much a creative outlet for me. We were talking about why I decided to interview Katie Hopkins before we went live. And I, sa I said that my podcast is in a way and my, my, my art. It's my portfolio. Mm. Um, and so David Icke, controversial, but he's a page or a piece of art in my portfolio. And if you're an art collector, you probably want something ultra modern. You probably want an installation. You probably want a piece from each era. You probably want something that you just like the look of, no matter what the value that goes in your house. In your, and, and I'm the same with the podcast. It's like, okay, how can I have my own creative needs met, how can I create a, a piece, a variety of works that together make something much stronger than the sum of the parts? A bit like your watch collection, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. Um, and yeah, I see my podcast like that. So if anyone wanted to get into podcasts for the first time, what is some of the advice that you would give them? Okay, um, so I think the route you went down is smart. Uh, and you decided to jump on our course and learn it all in two or three days. Um, because you'd have even seen some people, not many, but some people on that course, e either they didn't launch or they launched yeah. months after you. And I got a mentorship from yourself yeah. and it kept me, kept me accountable. Yeah. And I think that's one of the most important things. I was just saying to Harry about um, releasing an episode every Wednesday. I know that I need to have a few in the bank. Yeah. 
Um, because if I don't, I'm going to be letting down the listeners or yeah. I'll be de- letting down the, 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 the uh, team members. Mm. So it's, I think it's really, really important to get some kind of um, mentorship or guidance from someone who's been there, done that, but Agreed. keeps you accountable. Yeah, account- and that accountability is the big word because we've all got something more important to do in the week than launch a <coughs> podcast episode. Yeah. It's going to be the most important thing when you're Joe Rogan, but until then, there's, there's sales, there's marketing, there's you know, business that, um, that, that needs to be done. But we all know that we make excuses um, and we all know with a bit of accountability that you get it done. You, you, you know, you, you do a lot of boxing, you're a personal trainer, you're in the ring with your coach, it's, it, you get it done. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, you know, you can scrap around and go on Amazon and figure out what equipment to use and you can use Anchor and you can do it more sort of hobby-ish. But, you know, you've got two cameras there You've got, you're building a team, I've got a team, we've got cameras in this room, I live feed it out to my community. I decided if I'm gonna do a podcast, I'm gonna do it properly. Um, Now I'm fortunate enough that I have resources to be able to do that. And if I had none, I would start just lobbing it straight up on Anchor with a basic bearing a C1 mic and a Zoom H4 or something like that. So I suppose it depends. And it's better to start that way and then build up and make it more professional as you go than do nothing. So start now, get perfect later, but if you can, uh, take a bit of time and you've got a bit of resource to be able to get properly educated and get some good equipment, then you're going to make your piece of art better. Mm. Um, how come you decided to launch two podcasts? Because you've got the disruptive entrepreneur and then you've got money. Yeah. What was the full process behind that? Um, I think part of it was because I'd always had it in my mind to do a second podcast. Mm-hmm. Because if someone says, Rob, should you do A or B? The first thing I think is, well, can you do A and B? The first thing Mark thinks, my business partner, is can we not do either A or B? Can we do none of them? Um, So my brain always goes, why can't we do both? And it had been itching me for a couple of years. And I I sort of have my own little mini brand of money because of the book and that kind of thing. And I just thought, I have a foundation, which is helping um, people get better financial education. (coughs) And so I felt that, If there's any individual brand, it could be that. And that book out of all of my books has sold the most copies. That that podcast, Harry, how many episodes are we into money now? 85. Wow, I thought it was like 40 odd. So we're in 85 in now. It's not as big as my Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast. Um, And I would say I probably don't give it quite the love. I mean, the content's good, but the episodes aren't as long. And we always have more in the bank, more episodes done for Disruptive Entrepreneur in advance than money. I think I'm glad I did it. I think I needed to do it. I think I would dissuade anyone from doing more than one podcast until they've got a big podcast already. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I just felt like all the things that I do around money, the education, the books, the foundation, they'd get lost in my Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast. Yeah, because yeah. I noticed, I think, um, Grant Cardone, I used to follow him on a few he of his podcasts, and they, they've now all been fold, funneled yeah. into one. Mm. And I just thought, that makes sense in some, yeah, in quite a lot of ways, because people could just find it in one place, yeah. but then that's why I was a little bit unsure why you had to. That's why I had to ask you that question. Yeah, I mean, it's still like an ongoing experiment in that I'll never know if it was the best thing, because I can't undo it. But, you know, it's probably, it probably gets a third or a half of the downloads of Disruptive Entrepreneur, give or take. Mm. There's still a lot more downloads I'm, I'm getting. You know, it's like a, a 30 or a 50% uplift. So that's obviously really good. Um, I feel like that, that the, the brand of money, people want to make more money. A lot of people want to make more money, but they won't admit it. A lot of people have got money baggage. And I feel like, because I do quite a lot of things and I have quite a lot of sort of verticals or micro brands. Mm-hmm. I think out of any of them, that's the one that could go big. And so I'm quite happy just to keep that going, giving value, doing its thing. Um, and, and, and it may explode. Um, I didn't really want it, like all those 85 episodes, if I was just to sort of shuffle them into the disruptive entrepreneur, I'm not sure that would make sense. Um, so it's like its own little entity on yeah. the side. Is it slightly slightly different narrative sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I think we could get more clear on the uniqueness of the concept compared to Disruptive Entrepreneur. Like, I don't do interviews on that one, so it's not an interview show. The episodes are shorter. Mm-hmm. There's one a week, not two. But I think, you know, like, I was always the sort of artist. I'd never really finished a piece of work, and I had to force myself to, because I'd always go back to it. I'm sure there are other artists yeah. you know that are like that. 
Um, and so I'm always like that with my podcasts. I like the fact I could go back to either of my podcasts and go, let's try this, let's do this. Hmm, you know, let's, let's disrupt it. And I, I think I'll do that at a couple of points in time with money. I won't, won't be changing titles or anything like that, but testing a new format or giving it a, 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 a sort of a, a consistent theme or something. But, yeah. You know, there's 85 good episodes there for people if they want to make more money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, slightly changing like the, the, the question here. If you were to start, let's just say everything got wiped out and you were to start again, would it be property you would start first? Would it be your uh, property training company or would you go straight into podcasting? What would you do okay. straight away? Um, so again, my brain's going, can I do them all? But I can't. So I would not do property training until I've got credibility in property. I didn't do podcast training until I got a million um, downloads um, because I thought I need credibility. Mm -hmm. So I do jump on doing courses and trainings because it's one of my businesses. Mm -hmm. You're probably always looking for new up and coming artists. I'm always looking for new courses. It's my business. And some people criticize me that I've got a lot of courses. Someone even said, Rob, you do so many fucking courses. One day you'll do a course on how to sell a fucking course. I thought, that's a bloody good idea, I might. Um, so that's what I do. But... I'd never have done a course on something I've never done. Yeah. So I would probably start in property, build up some income. When I felt like I had a story to tell, I'd definitely have a podcast on it because you're documenting and commenting while you're doing it. Yeah. So the great thing about being a businessman and having a podcast is a lot of your content is just what you're doing in business. So you've got that leverage there. And then when I felt like, you know, I've got 20 properties or 50 properties or 100 properties or, or whatever made me credible, then of course I jump on courses. Yeah. yeah. I think I heard you as well when I was in, I think it was Mayfair, you was being asked a very kind of similar question. I think the first thing you said you would do is do a rent to rent business. Is that right? Yeah, well, I think back when Mark and I started, there was no rent to rent that we knew of. There probably wasn't even, in fact, I remember when the, the coin was phrased and it was after yeah, we got I into never, property. I never even heard of it no. until I actually started with you guys. Yeah. So um, really, rent to rent is just a way to get a property under your control. You're just renting from a landlord and then uh, subletting as long as the um, agreement says you can. Um, so when I started, I didn't have any money and I had to raise JV finance and buy buy to lets with Mark's money and Mark's family's money. And that's how we started. Now there's options, instalment contracts, um, <coughs> joint ventures, there's... Uh, rent to rent, there's rent to service accommodation. There's a lot more ways to buy property creatively without the need for a deposit. I would do that if I didn't have deposits. Uh, and then if I did have deposits, I'd use the deposits. That's because, you know, I know you put some of your own money into property, you take your profits from your business and put it into property because it's a better use of that money than just sitting in the bank. So if I had a load of cash, I'd park it into property. Yeah. If I had no cash and I wanted to get into property, I've got to figure out how can I get into property without cash. Is there a, a plan for you and maybe Mark to scale the property company even more aggressively or do you think it's going at a nice pace at the moment? Mm, yeah, I mean, I think we're aggressive without taking massive risks. So we're doing an 85,000 square foot development at the moment, which will be a hundred flat conversion. That's a big deal for us. Mm. Um, I mean, in London, that would be more than a hundred million. It'll end up in 22 million. Um, it might even massive, be 200 yeah. million in London because we're in Peterborough, it's a lot cheaper. So Mark and I are quite happy with, we've got two big developments we're doing, one smaller but still big, that we're doing right now. And I don't feel that we need to do a load more because um, this big development will end up being a five-year project, so it's mm -hmm. a lot. So I feel like we're as aggressive as we should be without taking big risks there. The property training business, I and mean, we're already the biggest training company in the UK by a decent margin from all the research that I've done. Um, so really our next, we've got to maintain that, but then take it more globally yeah. and, do, and do training in other countries. Um, I do like to take risks, but I don't like to put everything at risk when I take risks. Um, and it, I, I'd never want to go bust. I've never gone bust. I've never lost anyone's money. I've never you know, screwed anyone over because I've been you know, in a position where I've had to feed my family at all costs. And I'm proud of that. Of course, you know, I've had a couple of slaps, you know, like handbag slaps or, you know, the old ding dong in, in business because that's business. Mm. But, you know, there's people who've gone bust, there's people who lost loads of investors' money and all of that, and I haven't done that. And Mark and I could have taken some bigger risks and either been bigger or been more bust. Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd, I'd go a bit slower if it meant I've got security because I just don't want to do that. And I, look, I'd, if, if, I, if I went bust and I'd start again, I'd probably sulk for a little while and then start again. But I don't want to have to. Yeah. 
Um, just researching uh, both of your stories, am I right in saying when you first started, you were doing JVs and you had like a, almost like an investment club almost, well, where people pulled money in? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, over the years, we've refined the products we put out to market based on market demand. Okay. Uh, and also, I suppose, to a certain degree, where we are in our journey. So Mark, Mark and I, Mark started buying property when he was like in his late teens, early 20s. Yeah. I met him and he already had a, a dozen or so buy to let's give or take. He bought some of them with his stepdad. But he was also working in a job in a property sourcing company. He didn't really need the money, but he wanted to get the education and experience. So he was working in that company in a job. I met him and he helped me get a job in that company. And we were sourcing properties to sell to clients. Okay. Um, so we, we call that deal packaging. On the side, evenings and weekends, Mark and I bought 20 properties in, year, in that year. Um, then we set up on our own the next year and we bought another property, 30 properties ourselves. And we did deal packaging for ourselves, not for this company. And then after a while, we thought, well, instead of just sourcing one deal, we'd source three or four or a very small portfolio. And we did quite a few hundred of those properties. Um, but then maybe a year or two into that journey, we got into the training, the education, because um, it's pretty fast to do that. We had the credibility, we had the story. And that business grew and grew and grew at a much bigger rate with a much lower risk. It was a lower, a lower risk business model. It didn't rely as much on the growth of the market, etc. So when that business got to a certain level, the training, mm -hmm. we, we didn't need to scale the sourcing for others. Um, so we just slowed that down. And eventually, I mean, we still own probably a good couple or 300 properties where we have equity shares in clients' properties. But we, don't, we haven't sourced any new properties in that model for quite a few years because... We didn't want to be relying on external market forces. Um, and you can get to the point where you're doing too many things. Yeah. Um, I mean, we pulled all of the properties that we had under management with, with letting agents, and we set up our own letting agency. We've got a letting agency there with about 12 staff in it. It manages pushing 900 properties now. Wow. Um, and, you know, that makes a good few hundred grand a year net profit. Did you bring um, someone else in from yes, the letting? Yes, yep. yes. Someone who'd run letting agencies before at a very high level, at a management level, um, because... Mark and I realised that was not our skill set. Okay. Um, and you can't have multiple streams of income and multiple businesses if you're doing them all. So I like to partner with people who have much more experience than me in that niche. Um, so, you know, if I wanted to get into the art business, I'm going to come and talk to you rather than try and start it myself because I've got no contacts, no experience. I, I do believe in partnerships. Um, yeah, so that was the journey. And um, we just didn't think that building portfolios p for people was globally scalable on a, on a big level. If we'd have just wanted to bumble along and buy 100 properties a year for clients, it sounds like a lot, but you know, it's not a huge amount. It's eight a month. We had easily the infrastructure mm -hmm. to do that. But you know what it's like with business. You always want to grow, 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 grow. And what you don't want to do is have to keep aggressively going, growing a business model um, or kind of become beholden to it. Um, whereas training... You, you know, like um, I'm talking to someone about setting up a, a training platform for people who do cosmetics and eyebrow tattooing and lip tattooing and Botox and all of that, teaching the business elements of that. Mm. I mean, that, that could be a 10 million or 20 million pound business. So training is such a great business model. As long as you've got, I, so I like to partner with people who've done it or do it myself. And we've got the resources to set up, you know, obviously we've got the studio in here, we've got a, a training suite over there yeah. upstairs you can fit 250 people in it you've got two rooms downstairs for maybe 120 each yeah so I, I love the training model as long as you're credible yeah where i was getting to i think with the at the start of it with property focus is someone like who's been on your podcast grant cardone cardone has got a fund yeah is that something that's ever like you fancied yeah. ever doing that or was there too much red tape involved or well, Mark and I have flirted with that over the years. We nearly set one up about seven years ago. I mean, the cost to set them up are, you know, some, a bit eye-watering sometimes, and the regulation is significant. Um, I guess the reason why Mark and I didn't do it is because, you know, with collective investments, there's a lot of regulation, mm -hmm. that's one. And Mark and I are very entrepreneurial, and we like to be able to have some freedom, and, and that would, to a certain degree, take that away. Um, two is, um, why don't you just joint venture directly with someone rather than getting five grand off a hundred people. Why don't you just get, you know, five million quid off one person? You got a lot less people to deal with, a lot less regulation. Now, look, if Mark and I wanted to buy five billion pounds worth of property while we're alive, we may have to scale up and, you know, have a fund. But it's not really on our, 
I think with Grant Cardone, my perception, I know the guy quite well and he's mm. spoken at some of my events, I've sp- spoken to him uh, in length quite a lot of times. I, he, I think he's got a higher capacity for risk than we have. Um, and I think that has a downside as well as an upside, but you know, things are going good for him. Um, I wonder what share of that $800 million he's raised is actually his because minimum 50% of all the properties Mark and I own are ours. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, I think it's just a different model. And um, we like to own the property, whereas the fund goes in and you get a small amount of the fund, but we want to own the asset. Yeah, makes sense. Mm. Outside of business, outside of um, doing podcasts, I've never really asked you, what do you actually do? Like, Because it just seems like yeah, all, your, all, all you're ever doing Mate, is work or, or talking. But what, what do you do for fun? I don't have a life. Um, <laughs> I know you've got your dog, Ralph, so I've yeah, seen that. Yeah. Taking your son to golf. Yeah. But yeah, I don't really know if anyone gives a shit, but I'll answer it just in case they I do. I think they do. Yeah. Um, so I'm sort of a an amateur fitness. I'm like... I do. I work out most days. I certainly am no, you know, Greek statue or anything like that. But I think I'm in decent, half decent shape, um, and I, that's important to me. And every now and again, like once a year, I go crazy and I get a six pack or I do a little challenge. But then for sort of six months of the year, I'm just comfortable. So I, fitness is important to me to a certain degree. I, I'm really into all things that are art. So mm-hmm. I love art. I love fashion and clothes and watches and anything that has sort of some creative expression. I love to collect those things. Um, I love vinyl. So um, I I have a um, very high-end hi-fi system that I could just sit on my own and get the vinyl out and just escape somewhere. Um, I do like material things that are made with passion and beauty and enthusiasm. Um, So, you know, that's why like we've got similar interests in that regard, our watches, cars. It's, and it's not just a material item, it's the, the art and the creative work that's gone in. Um, I, I mean, I, my biggest passion is business. Mm-hmm. Obviously, my son, with his, all of his world championships and European championships with golf, has been a big thing in my life. Um, but really, my biggest passion, you know, obviously up there with my family, is my profession as well. And so I get most of my hobby needs met professionally and I feel very lucky because I don't know how many people on the planet can say that and people are always saying Rob you work so hard you work so hard you work so hard and I know it sounds like a bit of a cliche but when you love what you do you don't see it as work Mm. I I have to get forced to stop whereas a lot of people have to get forced to start start yeah Um, I have to get forced to take time off whereas a lot of people have to get forced to go to work and I just want that to last for my whole life because I think surely one of the things you want to experience in your life is to be able to do a bit more of what you love. Yeah, I think um, I think the the the, the common th- uh, thing that I get when people talk about you in a good way is <laughs> because na- they your, talk about me in a bad way your, as well. Yeah. It, is your natural energy. Yeah, and I think that's such a healthy thing to have, not just in business but in life itself. Yeah. And I think that's the foundation to being a good salesperson. Right. Yes. Um, I do. Yeah. Whenever I speak to people about business. Um, I just have my interpretation of it. I think number one thing you need to learn to begin with is the art of sales and communication. Do yeah. you think that's a very, very important thing, like a very important skill set and mindset to have? Yeah, I do. I think that um, if no one sells anything in the world, nothing moves and everything dies. Um, and sales is a service. People sometimes feel that sales is a, an encroachment, if that's a word, or um, something dirty. Not so much in America, but certainly in the UK. But sales is a service. You know, like there's a a saying which I like is, you know, maybe people don't like to be sold to, but everyone loves to buy. And and so a great salesperson allows someone to buy rather than sells to them too aggressively. And I've tried to refine those skills over Mm. the years. It's a great personal skill to have, like confidence or marketing or, or, you know, being a a positive person. So, so, um, yeah, I think that learning to sell is vital. And you're always going to be able to hustle yourself out of a hole if you can sell well. And you want to know deep down that you could hustle yourself out of a hole because we're all going to fall into some in our life at some point. Um, I second that. I've been through that a couple of yeah, times myself. Yeah, if you can yeah. just graft your way out of it, because you can't meditate your way out of it. I don't give a fuck what all these hippies say. You cannot meditate yourself out of a hole. You yeah. can hustle yourself out of it. Well, maybe you can. Maybe I'm not as good enough at meditation yet. But um, So that thing you said about... Um, you know, that, the energy and the enthusiasm. I really believe that. Now, um, I'm not necessarily a big expert in the areas of health and nutrition and stuff, but people always ask me where I get my energy from because, uh, you know, like I do have a lot of energy every day. 
and, and I think people are thinking, you know, the, the food you eat, whether you do exercise. Um, I think those are, are important for energy. But I'm going to make a statement which I don't know what proof there is, but I'd like this to be explored more. I believe more energy is drawn from passion. And your purpose, basically. Yeah, and I, yeah exactly. So I'll give you an example. When I was, what, 14, I used to play Tekken 2 with my mates. And we would finish school at 4 o'clock, come back to mine or theirs, and we'd play Tekken 2 till 1 in the morning. No break, no food, mm -hmm. no nothing. 4 p.m. to 1 p.m. No break, no nothing. Uh, why? Because we loved it. It mm. was the banter between the lads. It was the sort of, you know, it wasn't just the playing the game. And, you know, when you're uh, at university or people are studying, you, you know, you get those sort of geniuses or you get those people who are, are renowned for just working all the time. But they don't even eat for like 10 hours and they're doing something that's work but play. So I believe if you've got passion, enthusiasm, desire, purpose for something, that is the greatest source of energy that man can have um, because that can take you without eating for 24 hours and you don't even think about mm. it. Um, so of course the right foods makes a difference. Of course exercise makes a difference. But if you do exercise and you eat the right food and you have no passion or enthusiasm for what you do, you're just going to go, oh, as soon as you've come back from the gym. Yeah. And that's where I get this. It's like a life force energy. I can't really explain where it comes from. It, it must be connected to somewhere. But I get it from people. You know, we have that energy because we have common interests. It started by a Patek Philippe watch. And, you know, you relating to some of the courses that we did. And that's energy and passion and enthusiasm and drive and motivation and you know like burning the midnight oil and not giving up it all comes from that yeah you, know, you can't have a red bull and think you're going to not give up for the next three weeks or whatever he, he loves uh, red bull yeah Chris. i like <laughs> you know like i have coffee so yeah. i'm not i'm not judging but the point is passion purpose you don't need a red bull yeah yeah so in um october the 26th I'm fighting. I haven't fought since 2013 as, as boxing. I had over yeah. 14 fights uh, back in the day and I thought I was going to challenge myself again. Yeah. And going back to what we were just saying about purpose, I love training. I love running. I love bo boxing. I love doing weights. I love sparring, most importantly. But now I've got this date and I know there's an opponent in there who wants to fight me and probably hurt me badly. I've now got this high level of purpose, a high level of drive. Mm. And I feel that if you can transfer that into life itself with goals, businesses, family, uh, a vision for the future, you're gonna have that sustainable purpose that's gonna yeah. drive you forward and get that natural energy, which people buy into. Yeah. And I think that's the real kind of core of sales, mm. where you're not necessarily asking for money off them, but you have so much energy that people are attracted to you, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I think that essentially, the element you've added in there as well that we haven't talked about yet is accountability. And we mentioned it a bit earlier, but um, a, a purpose and a passion and something bigger to work towards and for and accountability to get there are key elements of success. Mm -hmm. So um, back in the last year, I got myself up to about 84 kilos, which for me is I'm squeezing a bit on my 34 inch waist. And that's all, because I used to be a fat kid, that's my like big time warning. And I always go psycho, lose the weight at that point. Um, and I just went on Facebook and said, I'm not happy with where I'm at. I want some kind of accountability or challenge who's up for it. Quite a few hundred people went, yeah, I'm up for it. Because it was also in December where everyone was feeling like lethargic and yeah. eating too much. And we, I ended up setting up a WhatsApp group. And uh, we, we ended up getting, I think, 30 or 40 of us in. There's a couple of people here who are in that. And everyone, and in the end, I decided, let's up it. And everyone put 500 quid in, and we had a competition to see who got the best body transformation. And I lost 10 kilos in six weeks, and I'm not a fat person. And, I, you know, a lot of people wouldn't have thought I had that amount of money, weight to lose. I went back to the that gym. I started yeah. sparring again. You know, I, was, um, I got a personal trainer. I was <laughs> training with more desire and drive. Uh, I was training smarter. Um, I just ran a six-day challenge, a six-day make cash challenge, and I've got 1,800 supporters on my Facebook supporter program. And like, there's people making cash all over the place. Um, Natalie made nearly six grand. Catherine Morgan made over five grand. Camilla, who's watching this, she made 27,500. Um, Kerry, she did eight grand in sales and 12 grand worth of bookings. Um, Paul Wilkinson, he did 10 grand in one sale. Now, they, they, would do, they weren't doing anything really that different to what they kind of had learned, or, except they had to do it in six days. Mm. And they had a competition. 
just a bit like you've got a fire, you know, you've got, you've got a bit of fear of loss. You've got a bit of a competitive element. And that's, so you've got to get accountability in your life. And the easiest person to lie to is yourself. So in that regard, accountability needs to come from someone else, ideally, because there aren't that many people that can hold themselves to the high standard. Yeah. But having a diary appointment with someone important or having a coach or a mentor or being in a competition, you know, where there's winners and losers, all heights uh, accountability. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I've got it in my own mind, in my own head, that as soon as I um, make myself accountable, like a boxing fight, even though boxing's got nothing to do with the property business I'm a part of, or podcasts, or uh, maybe the art business, for some reason, I come across the very, very best clients, like a big collector, for example. Mm. They suddenly pop themselves out the woodwork. Now, people can call that coincidence, people call that luck, people call that whatever. Serendipity. I just, yeah. think, I just think that when you're like a refined version of yourself and you're becoming the best version of you by putting yourself under challenges. Because with boxing, it's not just about the actual boxing, it's about nutrition, mm. getting the right sleep in, putting yourself around the right people. With all that combined, I just end up becoming the luckier version of yeah. me. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever had that in your life. Yeah, uh, you know what? I probably should think about that more. I probably don't think about that in terms of outcome. I certainly want to be fitter, want to be stronger, want to be better want to give more value, want to be wealthier, want to be happier, want to grow. That, that, that for me is, it's a constant drive. It never goes away. It's a blessing, but it's also sometimes a curse. But yeah, I think when people see you becoming the best version of you, you're like to, likely to attract people who want to become the best version of them. Mm. And people who want to be the best version of them are usually more successful or want to be more successful. So there probably is some attraction in that in a a, a common sense level, but also like a vibration level, you know, a frequency level in terms of, you know, like, you know, when you meet people and you get a good sense of them or you like their energy or their positivity or there's just something, you just get a good feeling. That's likely, yeah, common interest, but it's also likely a frequency, mm. you know, because people who are lethargic, slow, down on themselves, critical, negative, that's a lower frequency. And that's not as attractive as a higher frequency, you know, like, I do certainly believe that, yeah. So if you are at a higher frequency, you're going to attract that same level of energy. Mm. Yeah. Uh, just a few more questions, Rob, because mm. I know you're a busy man. I know you've got a, a call to make later on. So um, if you were to reflect on your life, what would you say, it's a bit of a cliche thing, but what would you say has been the hairiest moment you've had in life or in business where you think, you know what, it didn't go quite right, it was a bit of a setback, something you learned from. Uh, uh, in life, I feel like I've made lots of small mistakes. Um, and I don't feel like I've made a massive one yet. Because I, I get asked that a few times, you know, what's your biggest mistake, what's your biggest failure? And I always have this blank. So what came in my head was when I was 17, I crashed my motorbike and I probably weren't far off killing myself. Busted a load of bones. I won it. I was 19 when I crashed my bike. Mm. I spit my kidney open really? in it and ended up in a hospital, yeah. yeah. But I, I needed to, if I hadn't have done that, I'd have killed myself by the time I'm 30. So mm. that was a sm relatively small mistake. Um, we had a, a difficult time in business, probably 11, 2011, 2012. You know, cash flow was our biggest challenge. But I learned so much about business going through that. I don't know, I've probably said and done the odd silly thing. I've probably had partnerships where if I did them again, I'd do them differently. But I don't know, I think it's smart to fail fast, fail often and fail small. Hmm. And I think I've probably lived to that. Like other people might perceive I've made a massive failure, but I don't look at anything in my life and think, you know what, that was a massive failure. Yeah. Um, and I'm t I tend, you know, I, I know I've, for me, the biggest thing that hurts me is if I hurt people. It's the one thing I don't want to do mm -hmm. is hurt people. Now, sometimes people are hurt, but you're just being you. And I've learned that. I even learned that today in a meeting I just had, that sometimes you're just really different to people and you being you will hurt them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're on your own journey and there's consequences to that. And I accept that mm -hmm. because I've also been the victim yeah. the other way around or victim, but you're not never a victim if you learn. Um, but there's probably been a couple of partnerships I've had where if we started again, I'd take a bit more time up front to, because I, I get into partnerships and I get all excited. 
and sometimes we need to take six months to draw up the agreement. And I'm just like, nah, come on, let's go. But then in two years, you're like, all these things come up in the partnership that weren't in the agreement. So I'm doing a couple of partnerships at the moment and the agreements are taking months. And my natural urge is like, man, I'm frustrated with this. Yeah. But if we have the proper agreement, we won't have the fallout at the back end. So if there is anyone out there that has been on the receiving end and been hurt by me, I'm sorry, I love you. I never meant it. I'm a bit of a softy. Um, I always try and make up with people if I've fallen out with them and sometimes I need to leave them for a year. Okay. But I'm proud of that, that I've, I've made up with, a, you know, I don't think I've got many enemies out there, but I've made, I try and make up with people once the water's under the bridge. Um, I upset someone today and I've got to go, I'll have to wait till tomorrow and I've got to go and do that. And I like, I think that's a gift and I think it's a, a development of my personality because I'm not stubborn or, um, you know, ego driven because my ego wouldn't have let me do that a few years ago. Um, so I love you all and I'm sorry I'm just trying to do the best I can <laughs> so the question I, I would naturally ask after that is what would you say i would probably engineer this towards business what do you think has been probably a big moment where things just took off for you um, the reason why I ask this as well is because I asked two developers this recently one of them said to me he said when they met their business partner because they were they were like a not a small time developer but they were a developer who was doing quite well i think it was probably on the verge of being a millionaire or small time millionaire almost uh, but his back his back end was really uh, messy like had paperwork everywhere and he joint forces with this guy his brother has got a uh, is an mp yeah. and it got him a lot of work mm. so that was number 1 the other developer said they won this um, big job, which ended up making the company something like 70 million or something mm. ridiculous. And he's, they both said those two things are changed the course of the, their business. Yeah. What would you say has happened for you maybe in business or just in your life? Yeah, so I've got a few. Um, I think often people are searching on podcasts like this, and I get it, and it's a fine search, but I don't think it's the full answer for the one moment, the fork in the road. For me, I've had quite a lot of forks. So definitely the biggest one was meeting my business partner, Mark Homer, and starting Progressive um, because, you know, we had complementary skills. Um, but, you know, leaving my dad's pub and setting up my art business was quite a big one because even though I was working sort of not in a proper job because it was for my mum and dad, it was still working for my mum and dad. And that was quite a brave move when I, I left and set up in, as an artist and I didn't have the money to do it. So that, that, I taught myself I could take a risk that most, of, most people can't. Mm -hmm. So that was quite a big thing for me. Um, going from art into property and meeting, like I said, meeting my business partner, Mark Hamer, was quite a big thing to me. Um, buying properties with his money was quite a big thing to me. Setting up the, the, the deal packaging business and then the training business were quite big things to me. Breaking world records, various books I've written, doing podcasts and stuff like that. Um, I've probably got my bigger ones to come because I've got a couple of possibly really big TV shows that um, are under development at the moment. But I would say they're not two pivotal moments in 12 or 15 years. They're sort of compounded moments. And of course, you've got no split test, have you? Because you look at that and go, oh, that, that changed everything. But you haven't got a comparison where that wasn't there. Because I really believe that, let's say I took an opportunity here and then that, I made something of that. Well, if that wasn't there, I'd find another one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've all been in love and lost that love and thought, thought we're never going to find that love again. And then we find that love again. Mm. And then we get divorced from that love again and then we go and try and find that love again again. So, you know, like I, I'm a great big tester. I try lots of things. I'm prepared to fail fast. I'm prepared to fail on high volume to find the diamond. Yeah. Um, and that's probably more relevant an answer than, you know, meeting Mark or getting a world record or launching a podcast. They've obviously been great for me. But there's probably a million things I've missed out on as well. You know, if I'd have started a YouTube channel when I found out about YouTube, I'd be huge by now, but I didn't. Um, you know, if I'd have set up a Facebook group when everyone was telling me to before I did, that would have been huge by now. So life's a journey. Um, and I think sometimes we're a bit romantic, aren't we? We're waiting for the big thing to change our life or, you know, when's that, when am I going to get that luck? When am I going to get that change? I think it's just what you do every day. Yeah. Just two more questions yeah, sure. then. Okay, this is a new question that I've been asking recently to my guests. If you were to recap on our conversation, this episode, how would you title this particular podcast episode? 
For some reason, it catches everyone, this one. Um, I would say it's a journey and a study, to use your title, of the balance of your passion and your profession. You know, doing what you love and loving what you do and figuring out how to be the best version of yourself. I would say that summarises most of the things we've talked about. Definitely. There you go, that was pretty succinct for someone who talks so much. <laughs> At the end of the disruptive uh, entrepreneur, you say, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. Yeah. I the say, amount of people that spit that quote back in my face, by the way, when they want to influence me and get me to do something. <laughs> well, Rob, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. You say it. I think it's a, it's a brilliant, um, what do you call it, a catchphrase? Yeah, or a quote, or a quote. quote that yeah, I came up with, yeah. So my one is be happy, never content. If yeah. I were to ask you your interpretation, your, your view on that, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I think that's, I like that, be happy, never content, because I think that people get happiness and contentment and fulfilment and elation, because there's different happiness experiences that we feel, and, and they're very confusing. I know I sometimes confuse them. I am never content, but I am often happy. And if I, if I tried to get my happiness from contentment, I'd never be happy. Yeah. For me, contentment is I've given up on the pursuit of everything that I could be. And that is not me, and that is not my life. Now, sometimes I do think, oh, man, it's a bit tiring, you know, all this driving and striving. But I realise that I get all my happiness linked to the driving of being uncontent. Um, and so contentment and happiness are a paradox which I need to be... To have together. I always say to people when defining happiness, because I think most people don't understand it, um, I think people do mix fulfilment, contentment, happiness and momentary elation. They confuse it. But if I were to ask you when you are the most happy, when you've been the most happy, so the most happy probably isn't relaxed. It's probably a strong sense of elation, fulfilment, reward, victory, you know, the attainment of something you've wanted for so many years. The, the, the thing that popped into my mind straight away is when I've, when I've, when I've been sparring or just after, yeah. and I might have been hurt. Yeah. And the weird thing is, I kind of like it. Yeah. It's just a really weird thing. Yeah, it's not weird. It's yeah. just how we're chemically wired. So the reality is, the strongest sense of happiness and achievement in your life, in our lives, are straight off the back of the hardest things we've ever done. Mm. So, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever watched The Dawn Wall or Free Solo. It's about um, climbers who climb Netflix, the, hard, yeah. the hardest um, mountains in the world. One guy did it with no rope and another guy did it with a, two guys did it with a rope, but it was just the hardest climb ever. Um, and, you know, th these people have, have trained their brain. They even tested it on the film to um, have less fear. It's like a part of their brain that, that since they've trained it, otherwise they would just never be able to climb with such risk. And when you see them get to the top and you see how elated they are, would they ever achieve that sense of happiness not climbing the mountain? No fucking way. So I sometimes need more little... I need to sometimes give myself a bit more of a break and have little moments of, oh, I like that, I'm grateful for that, thank you for that, I'm just being, because I'm not a very good being. I'm a good doing, I'm not yeah. a very good being. But... I'm always chasing that addiction of the greatest sensations in the world. Probably the greatest sense of elation right up there in my top five is when I broke the speaking world record. My voice has never recovered six years on. That was the hardest thing I've ever done. I had out-of-body experiences. Even David Goggins looked at me and went, man, how did you speak for 40 hours out of straight? And he is like the most hardcore person on the yeah. planet. 48 and, and hours. I know. And like, I, I felt amazing. Amazing after that. I, I, like, if I could get, if I could feel like that once a year for the rest of my life, that'd be worth 364 days of pain. So that's what I think be happy, never content means. All right, wicked. Thank you for coming on my podcast. One year in, and uh, well done on everything you've done. It's been inspiring you. to see you on your journey, and you've interviewed some cool people. And I notice how your setup's got more and more professional, you know, and you're doing the cameras and the YouTube. Um, and definitely, I see you out there a lot. So you've You've just done what you can do with a podcast. It's great. Now it's about stepping it up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Cheers, All right. Steve. Good best. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye.